yeah, thank you very much, uh, Taron, for the nice introduction. Um, and also, yeah, thanks, uh, Christiane and Taron, for organizing this workshop and for having me. I think it speaks to us that we actually are part of a community that I think with mostly everyone who's been uh, talking so far, I see uh, strong collections, uh, connections to my own work, which uh, actually allows me to skip through some of the bits uh, in the beginning a bit more quickly because we've heard from uh, other speakers about that and maybe leave a bit more time towards the end for what I consider the more juicy bits. But um, yeah, let's start just also yeah, to, to maybe reiterate here again, so I work in a library. Um, in Berlin, actually, if you come to Berlin, uh, get one of the library passes, they're free um, for every human on this planet. Um, and it gives you free access to the both beautiful library venues. You know, we have one in former East and one in West Berlin. And also, for example, libraries maybe, for those who are not aware, through a library pass, you can sometimes get access to like journals, which you would otherwise have to pay to access the articles. And yes, yeah, so it's for free. Um, yeah, we also have, of course, uh, digitized collections where we publish our digitized data, currently about 250,000 uh, documents. We provide them via an API under a public domain license, but again, to reiterate, reiterate due to copyright laws currently, we stop at 1945, so you can only find content from like, I think, 8th century currently until 1945, which gives you some idea of the variation space. And we also have a lab where we do like events like hackathons and this. Um, yeah, machine learning in uh, my library, we started basically doing a machine learning projects in 2016, working in the area of OCR, which still has many challenges, despite some have been solved in those years. Um, mostly we have uh, several concurrent projects, which currently allows me to run a team with about nine people or yeah, to uh, eight full-time positions, which I think is quite substantial for a library, uh, yet those are all third-party funded projects, so we constantly need to reacquire uh, new funding. Um, what I really want to highlight, because I think it's important, is we don't have just machine learning engineers on our team. We have two people who really trained librarians, and we have a research data manager, which we took particular care that's also a historian, so someone who can help us with uh, that uh, kind of expertise. We have a couple of GPUs and um, that allows us to play around with some uh, stuff. Currently, I think if we pair those, we get 128 gigabytes of VRAM, so you can do some stuff with that. Um, the end goal, of course, as we've said, um, is to provide open and digital access to all these information and data in the library, 24-7, uh, freely and online. And yeah, you could also reframe it as I sometimes want to say, you turn, want to turn the library from a book museum into a digital information infrastructure. So um, yeah, I rushed rush through those quite quickly. So um, again, uh, slides will probably be available later on. As we've heard, there's a lot of different metadata standards, formats, data formats, and so on. We heard Maud speak about that extensively. So first thing we do when we do machine learning projects, we just dump it all into sorry, like flat JSON files, and we put, that, uh, we put some code up that allows you then to put that into a Pandas data frame for analysis, just to make it easy to work with. Then we start with the digitization, and yeah, there's still lots of problems, I would say, um, that um, we can keep on working on through a couple of PhDs or a couple of, couple of years. Uh, in the area of image enhancement, we've heard about that. Um, so some of the images were digitized um, with technology back then and it's not optimal to be processed today anymore. We still have to do binarization, so we reduce the information by going actually from a color or grayscale image to a black and white image. Um, so we throw away information, maybe sometime uh, in the future we don't have to do that anymore. Then we have to analyze the document layout first of all in order to understand where is actually text that we want to recognize, where is a table maybe, or where is an image. So there's all these different categories of data in a newspaper for example, and we have different processing chains for all of them. So um, I would say actually the problem of text recognition is nearly solved, but it just shifted to the problem of segmentation. So how do you actually find the correct text and put that into nice lines that then the recognizer can just recognize the text out of. Um, especially important with columns, multi-column documents like newspapers, you want to have correct reading order flow. 
So it doesn't help if like all the words on this page are correctly recognized, if like two article columns get merged, because then you can forget about any NLP application because the text is just uh, uh, rubbish in terms of like how it's semantically structured. Um, yeah, a nice byproduct of this uh, layout analysis is that we can find also, you see here um, in the bottom, there is like the screen part. So this is a very classic computer vision pixel labeling approach, very costly, but still working very well. And here we found an image. So what we can do is these images were previously not discoverable in our digitized uh, uh, library. So you can look for keywords, but you cannot query images. So we found actually we have about 600,000 images only in those digitized text documents. Maybe people would like to find them. So we, um, yeah, we're using a, 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 a modality shared clip model to do some uh, image similarity search. Um, but um, since it's modality shared, shared it's been pre-trained on text and images with shared weights. So it can also do prompting for image content, which is quite nice. That's a new feature for, for our users. So you type in big ship entering port and it will find you images uh, with that uh, uh, depiction and motif. Yeah, then the main challenge remains still uh, optical color recognition or handwritten text recognition. Um, there has been indeed significant progress. Um, this is basically from what we had before deep learning really started to get integrated into most OCR tools. And on the right we see there is now like one error in this uh, paragraph, but yeah, there are still errors. And um, sorry, we also tried post-correction with an LLM. We trained it on 300,000 text pairs of OCR errors and then the correct line with the corrected text. It didn't work. <laughs> it, it, it resolved some errors, but it introduced new ones. And those are really historians hate that. If you introduce like modern words into a historical text, if you work in a library, don't do that. And then, yeah, of course, um, once we arrive at the text, um, we also do these uh, uh, applications from NLP, like um, Maud already mentioned, named entity recognition, entity linking. Uh, we also participated with our system in the two hype editions, and we keep on uh, working with it. And you also heard some issues here already um, in the disintegration. There's this historical uh, spelling, uh, historical variation in the problem space. So yeah, still also lots of problems to be solved. If you, yeah, all our stuff uh, we've been working on is free, so you can find uh, all the software on our GitHub. We pro provide models on Hugging Face, as has been already shown, and we also provide the data sets that were used to train those models, um, either on Hugging Face or on Zenodo. So uh, everything, really, the whole uh, pipeline is freely available. But yeah, so... Um, We've also heard already there is like a couple of issues when you apply these uh, cool uh, industry data, uh, data, sorry, models to our historical data. And yeah, um, I think Maud already uh, framed it uh, much more, uh, much better. These slides I prefer this morning, sorry, they are a bit rough. But um, you've heard about these various uh, issues already. There's noise in the data. There's obviously the historical spelling. There is like a great variation in the topics and views held. And if you apply this, uh, these current state-of-the-art industry models, they have some problems too, like they hallucinate. And our main target users are researchers, so they require like highly accurate information. And if we use AI models, they require us to be transparent. Like, okay, what has this model been trained upon? We don't even know for GPT. Like, OpenAI doesn't disclose what it has been trained upon. We couldn't tell our researchers. And also, secondly, the provenance. Like, how, how has this model been trained? Using what parameters? Um, what kind of fine-tuning has been done to it? Can you trace back, actually, why the, this model generated a, a statement? Where does it derive from? From which part of the data? So these are all things that scientists require that we cannot do with current models. So um, yeah, we also heard that maybe uh, libraries, or if you want to call it the internet of the past, these memory organizations, they actually have a lot of data that has been assembled over centuries by experts because it's relevant. And what actually these people do in these organizations, they curate it. So they provide additional metadata, they contextualize it, 
they link it to authority files and other databases. So you have rich metadata and we preserve it. And if we have new versions, we also version it. So the scale is also quite significant. We have about 12 million texts in our library, 12 million images, currently 2.5 petabytes of data. But actually, uh, saying that to, to Elliot in the beginning, I think I had a talk here, I gave a talk here 10 years ago, where we um, spoke about the amount of newspapers digitized in Europe. And those were, I think, more showed some graphs. So 2014, those were 13%. And today, I checked, it was 22%. So <laughs> it's not like we have all this data digitally yet. We still have to go through these processes with all these problems. Uh, in order to get like the other 80%. And um, yeah, and then there are indeed, there are aggregators. So there are like uh, federated digital libraries, for example, for Germany, the German digital library or for Europe, Europeana, which are like websites which aggregate these digitized content from hundreds of institutions uh, throughout Europe. And yeah, would these not serve well to train better models for historical cultural data? Well, there are all these issues, of course, looking at this historical data, not only in terms of like uh, spelling and variation, but for example, we digitize a lot of content for researchers from the Nazi period and from the colonial period. We don't want to just straight away train models with that to become Nazis. <laughs> also, if we look at the content, like we digitize documents up to 1945, we checked that we found like um, there's about 4.7 percent of those books have been authored by females. This is because in the past they didn't have access to literacy. So there's obviously big flaws and biases in our collections and there are many more that we don't even know about that we use machine learning to identify and uncover. And there's the copyright cliff of death that has already been mentioned. So once you get to 45, like access drops and there's this big, big black hole of the 20th century. So, um, yeah, I'll be quick uh, rushing through the last slide. So we've been working, this has been mentioned already, in the Europeana context with other GLAM organizations to say, like, what can we do about this? And we adopted this approach from uh, Gebnu et al., data sheets for data sets, and created a template, uh, data sheets for digital cultural heritage, which actually gives you a template to fill in, um, which has um, ways to document like issues with the data, ethical issues, social issues, biases and flaws, make those transparent for people who are using this data when you put it on Hugging Face, for example. And we currently we're working with um, some researchers from the, the FLAIR group from uh, Berlin University to see can we train a model to be time and context aware? Because like the statement Berlin is the capital of, it can have very different truth conditions based on the time period that you're looking on. Or at some point in the past, it was true that the Zeppelin was indeed the fastest way to get to travel to New York. So we want to know when and how can we put that into a model. Um, I'm going to skip that, so it has already been mentioned. There's been some attempts like Bloom to, for example, focus on um, also in languages that are added in English. Because most of current AI stuff, it works nicely in English, but try to do that in a more niche language, like Basque. Yeah, more difficult. <laughs> so what are some ways forward? Yeah, we can maybe pre-train with more rich, more varied, and also contextualized data with metadata. Or maybe it's a fine-tuning task to train a model for like uh, becoming time and culturally aware. Um, we can think about, this is, I think, what is mostly done nowadays, uh, rule-based constraints and post-processing. And against this problem with hallucination, we have also like, new ways, for example, to do retrieval augmented generation. So there are some possible ways forward. Generally, I think we want to avoid this. And yeah, i leave that for a second. If you want to take a picture, I think this is from a paper I absolutely love, Data and its Discontents. Um, it speaks about a lot of problems with how data currently is gathered for machine learning. And I think this is the biggest contribution that maybe GLAMS can make other than be data providers for AI, is that other than just having AI to use for culture, we wanna have like 
culturally rich, responsible, and diverse AI data, and that means also curating it, taking care of the data, taking responsibility for the data, its problems and issues, working on that to have better AI in the end. Thank you.